Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to the next lesson in Organic Chemistry. I'm very glad that you've decided to join us, and I hope that you, if you're new here, that you will watch the next bit and learn how to enroll into our Grade Twelve Science class. So. In order to enroll into the Great Hall Science class, the first thing you need to do is go find your internet browser, your Google Chrome or your Firefox or whatever, and you need to type in into the search engine, you need to type in www.toenable.org and you'll come up with this landing page, okay? And if you've never been here before, you need to register. So when you register, you need to type in your first name, your last name, your email address and click register. After you've registered, you can log in and you log in with your email and your password. And if you want to, which I do, you can click the remember me, then you never have to worry about this password again, then you click log in. Okay, once you've done that, you'll come up with a page that looks like this, okay? For you guys, for the first timers, you'll have two subject, progress and results, and to enable help online. That is what you'll have on your screen. Okay, so now what you need to do is you need to go and actually enroll in the class. So you go to click choose subject. When you click your choose subject, okay, they'll come up with a whole list of subjects. And then you need to go and find your physical science grade 12 and you click on it and you type, you click on login and it'll send you back to this page, but then you'll have this blue block, which says physical science grade 12. Grade 12s, please note that you don't actually have to only register for grade 12. You can register for grade 12 and grade 11 and grade 10. The reason I mention this is because I find a lot of my grade 12s are missing some information from lessons that they've had in um, grade 12, 11 and grade 10 and then they struggle. Like they need to understand the, sorry, let me just take something out. Um, you need to understand the um, grade 10 periodic table and you need to understand your stoichiometry and you might not remember it. So it's always good to go back to that. Okay, so now once you've clicked that, then you can start watching our videos. But before they do that, I just want to point out your live assessments. What is going to happen and what I'm hoping to happen is that I will be able to run some live assessments. So what we'll do is we will, at the end of, say, for example, organic chemistry, I will set an assessment, which will be a multiple choice questions, but it won't only be in multiple choice questions, but anyway, and the point is that then you'll answer it, okay? And then after two days or however long I set it for, I will get the results back. And I'll say, oh, okay, majority of students did really well, but there's maybe 50% of them that didn't understand question three. And I'll go look at question three and I'll say, oh, yes, okay, that's about hydrohalogenation and halogenation, the difference between the two. So then I will be able to go back and teach you guys about the difference and make sure you guys understand that perfectly. Okay. But now, and more importantly, in order to watch the live session, you can click on the upcoming events, okay? And you will get to this screen here. <clears throat> so you'll get a whole bunch of different upcoming events depending on how many classes you've enrolled in. And then you click the view event button and you get to the screen here. And then you click the open live TV link. Okay, it's always quite self-explanatory, right? And you'll get to this page. You have the option to open the feed in a new tab, and I personally would do that because it makes your screen bigger and therefore easier to see. Otherwise, you can just click join the event. Okay, and you get to watch the video. Ta-da! Now, not only do you get to watch the lesson live, oh, by the way, if you miss the lesson um, or I've done the lesson and while you're watching it live and you didn't quite understand something and you needed to go and watch it again, you can come through exactly the same steps that you did before and click again, join the event and you can watch a recording of the lesson, okay? So now we're back into the live session. There is this button here, message studio button. And that for me is a very important button because that means that you guys can send me messages and you can say, hey Candice, I really enjoy that, or I really understand organic chemistry now. Can you possibly please teach us some redox, okay? Or 
please be more specific. I'm really under, don't understand how to prove that something is a spontaneous reaction using redox reactions, for example. Okay, so then I would go along and I would teach or once I've finished organic chemistry, I can then say, okay, fine. Well, I've got some students. They've had these problems with redox. Let's go through redox and I will address those issues. The whole point about these lessons is to make sure that we have a free flow of information and it's supposed to add to your learning experience. Also, please note that the message studio link only works during the live session. Don't try and message me when there's no lesson happening because it's not going to work. OK, so there we go. Now let's go back to organic chemistry. So we were talking about different properties of organic chemistry and we spoke about the functional groups, how they affected it. And now we need to talk about chain length and we've kind of touched on it already, but I have broken it down into different sections. So now you need to actually go through this. So one of the main properties of carbons is catenation. And what is catenation? Catenation is the ability of your carbons to make long chains with itself. So in other words, carbon, 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 carbon. And remember we spoke about the buckyball and the nanotubes, but most importantly, it can make long chains with itself. So when the molecular mass of the alkanes is low, the organic compounds are gases. OK, whereas if they're higher, the organic, the molecules are going to have um, be more likely to be liquids and solids. So let's look at this graph because this actually kind of explains exactly what we're talking about here. Over here, we've got methane, which has got a relative molar mass or molecular mass of 16. OK, yeah, you've got ethane, which has approximately um, relative molecular mass of 30. There's propane at 44 and butane at 58. Okay, grade 12, please understand that this isn't very well drawn because of the fact that these gaps from 16 to 30 to 44 to 58 aren't, you're not supposed to just number those, label those, okay, but they have to label those because it's a bit small, the diagram is a bit small. Similarly, your boiling point for my for methane is around about minus 161 to yeah minus 161. Your boiling point for ethane is approximately minus 89. The boiling point for propane is minus 45, and the boiling point for butane is minus one. Remember that your boiling point is a temperature at which you're going from a liquid to a gas, a liquid to a gas. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that when you have a very short chain, or not even a chain, okay, then you're going to have very weak intermolecular forces, okay, well, the intermolecular forces are very weak, and as the compound gets longer and longer, so the molar mass increases and therefore the intermolecular forces get stronger. And please note that the only intermolecular forces that we're talking about for all of these are London forces. Are London forces. Remember these are the induced dipole forces. Dipole induced dipole, etc, etc. So these are very weak forces, but as the chain gets longer, so the molar mass gets longer and so the, the forces get stronger, which means the boiling point increases. Okay, now let's talk about density. Remember the density, density equals mass over volume. Okay, so your density increases with increasing molecular size. That's important, okay? The density is going to increase with increasing molecular size. And what we're saying is that the mass of this increases, but the volume doesn't. So therefore, we end up with a greater density. The reason being, if you look, just have a look over here, do you see that this chain isn't a straight chain? It tends to be at angles. And remember, it's three-dimensional. So what actually happens is the longer chains actually fall in on themselves. So you end up taking up less space even though the mass is increasing. And when you're taking up less space in three-dimensional space, you end up taking less volume. Okay, so 
Now let's talk about flashpoint. Remember that the flashpoint of a vol volatile molecule is the lowest temperature at which the molecule can form a vapor mixture with air and be ignited. Okay, remember that. That is your definition. I keep harping on it because people keep forgetting what it is. So it's important. So the flash point of a volatile molecule is the lowest temperature at which the molecule can form a vapor mixture with air and be ignited. It obviously increases with increasing chain length. Okay, because of the fact that if you've got an increasing chain length, what is happening? You've got an increasing chain length. You are going to have an increasing um, strength of molecular intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces increase in strength. Okay. Now remember, what does that mean? How does that affect our vapor pressure? If we've got a stronger intermolecular force, what happens to our vapor pressure? Our vapor pressure decreases because if the bonds are stronger it means that they can't a vapor can't form because the molecules can't break the surface and the flash point is the lowest temperature at which the molecule can form a vapor mixture so in order for it to have a vapor mixture it has to have some vapor but if the vapor pressure is decreased it means that the vapor is not available and therefore it cannot reach its flash, flash point. And therefore we can say that the longer chains are less flammable, less flammable, so they're more difficult to actually burn. And remember we actually even spoke about this when we spoke about the fractional distillation column. Fractional distillation column where we said that column, where we said that there was a point where we had diesel and further up, much further up we had octane and I said to you that diesel you could actually put out a cigarette in it you could put out a cigarette because diesel works with pressure not with a spark whereas octane which is the petrol that you we use or it's one of the things petrols that we use in our cars actually uses a spark because of this flash point so we have spark plugs in normal petrol cars and in diesel cars we do not have spark plugs because diesel doesn't get ignited with a spark and that is because it's got a longer chain right they can still be burnt but it needs to have pressure and um, yeah it needs to be compressed okay now let's talk about ketones the solidity of ketones in water decreases as the chain length increases. And again, it's got to do with the fact that the greater the chain length, the stronger the intermolecular interactions between the ketone molecules. Okay, so remember we said that the ketones formed polar molecules. Okay, and what is a, a ketone in case you've forgotten? A ketone is got, what is it? Remember that aldehydes and ketones go hand in hand. Aldehydes and ketones go hand in hand. They both have a C double bonded O as a functional group. But the aldehydes have that C double bonded O at the end of the chain, whereas the ketone has it in the middle. And what happens is this double bonded O allows for hydrogen bonding when we are dissolving the substance in water. Okay, so let me see if there's a picture. Yes, there. Oh, no, it's just the ketone. Very boring. So let me show you. Let's say, for example, we've got propanone, C dash C double bonded O, and these are all hydrogens. And then let's say we've got an oxygen and a hydrogen and a hydrogen in water. So what happens is there's a hydrogen bond that forms between uh, possibly this hydrogen and that double bonded O. And because of that, we get what is called, well, basically the ketone becomes soluble. Okay, but the longer the chain length, the stronger the intermolecular forces between the ketone molecules. And remember the ketone molecules, the forces that they have are London forces, London forces, as well as hydrogen bonding, because another ketone could come along and have a hydrogen, and then they'd end up being a double bonded O to that. In other words, it could look like, oh, no space. Um, okay, I'll erase it. C dash C dash C double bonded O. And remember that these are all hydrogens. Hydrogen 
hydrogen, hydrogen. Now let's pretend that there's another ketone here. Um, okay. And let's say a double bonded O here, and there's a hydrogen there, and that's a hydrogen, that's a hydrogen, hydrogen. <clears throat> if they happen to come along next to each other, then there might be hydrogen bonding that occurs between those two over there and between these two over there. Okay, so do you understand? Obviously, that would be if they lined up perfectly and we assumed that this was a two-dimensional object. So do you understand that there would be London forces and hydrogen bonding, but the longer the chain length, the stronger the London forces, because that is dependent on your molecular mass. Okay, I'm just going to erase the link. So let's carry on. This means that more energy is required to overcome the intermolecular forces, so therefore the molecule is obviously less soluble in water. And like I said before, the long chains can also fold around the polar carbonyl groups and stop water molecules from bonding. I did say that long chains tend to fold around, okay? So this would be just a basic drawing, but if you look over here, you can see you've got a methane, methyl group there, 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 there. so you've got four there. One, two, three, four, five, sorry, five there. Okay, but here is your double bonded O. But the way it's shaped, you can see that it's kind of difficult for any other molecule to get near it compared to if, for example, it was sticking out over there. So therefore, you can say that it's actually a little bit more difficult for the water molecules to bond with it. And obviously, the longer the chain, the more it could actually go around. So you end up with this actually being hidden. So you'll notice that pentan 2 own which has got a double bonded O on the second carbon is 5.5% water soluble, whereas pentan 3 own which is where it's protected by these two methyl groups over here, is 4.8% water soluble. So when the long chains fold around your polar carbonyl group, it ends up with water molecules not being able to bond with it. Um, yeah, okay, moving on. So now let's talk about physical properties and branch groups. And we kind of have mentioned branch groups before a couple of times. Um, right at the beginning, we mentioned them with respect to drawing our structural formulae. And we've also spoken to, about them with isomers. So in straight chain molecules, the carbon atoms are connected to at most two other carbon atoms. Okay, that's if it's a straight chain. However, so that's what it looks like, okay? If we're looking at this carbon, do you see it's connected? One, two, okay? This carbon is connected to one, two, but this one's only one and that one's only one. So if it's a straight chain, the carbon atom is connected at most of two other carbon atoms. If it's a branched molecule, some carbon atoms are connected to three or four other carbons. So if we look at this one, we've got one, two, three. Okay, so there you can see that this carbon atom is connected to three other carbon atoms. <clears throat> So straight chains always have a higher boiling point than the equivalent molecule with the branch chain. And the reason that they give is that strange change molecules have a larger surface area. Okay. So therefore, it is easier to, um, it's more difficult to break them up. Okay, I just like to think of the fact that the way that's easy for me to understand it is this. Remember we said that the longer the main chain, the higher, the stronger the intermolecular forces, and therefore the higher the boiling point. So if you look here, we've got one, two, three, and four. So there are four carbons in the main chain. Yeah, we've only got three carbons in the main chain. So if there are three carbons in the main chain, obviously this has got weaker intermolecular forces than this one, and therefore this is gonna have a higher boiling point. So if you worry about this larger surface area, if you don't quite understand how that reaches a higher boiling point, then realize that it's actually, you can just think of it with respect to the length of the main chain. Right, density. <clears throat> now we've said that density equals mass over volume. So density decreases with an increase of branched groups. So the more branched groups we have, 
okay, the more branch groups we have, the smaller the density is. So density decreases if the number of branches increases. Okay, your vapor pressure also increases with increasing branch groups, but that makes sense because we just said the more branches we have, the more branches, okay, the lower the boiling point, which means it's going to be easier to evaporate, therefore there's going to be greater evaporation, right? which means that the vapor pressure is going to increase because now we've got more vapor above the liquid. Okay, so if you look at these, we've got pentane, 2 methyl pentane, and 2 2 dimethylpropane. So I'm going to draw these out for you just to give you an idea of what they look like. Pentane is pretty obvious. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and no, I'm not doing all the little hydrogens. Forget it. Okay, then we've got 2 methyl butane. Okay, and I'll do that in a different color. So we've got butane, one, two, three, four. And on the second carbon, there's a methyl group. And all my little arms are hydrogens. Guys, if you do this in the exams, you will get it wrong. So wherever you see little lines, you should be putting hydrogens. And then finally, so purple, you've got 2,2-dimethylpropane. Two, two so you've got propane, one, two, three. And on the second carbon, we've got two methyl groups. Okay, so you can see that we're going from a straight chain to one with one branch to two branches. Okay, so now let's talk about what this table says. Notice that the melting point is, it goes minus 130, minus 160, 16.6. Okay, and the melting point is a temperature at which you're going from a solid to a liquid solid to a liquid. So do you see that the melting point gets warmer, gets higher as we go from the, this to this, okay? Our boiling point is lower, okay? Our boiling point is lower. Boiling point of pentane is 36, whereas the boiling point of your propane is 9.5. So this is definitely a gas at room temperature. This needs to be heated up a little bit before it becomes gas, and pentane we need to heat up a lot. Okay, now let's look at the density. Do you see the density decreases as we become more branched? Okay, and that makes sense because density equals mass over volume. So as you become more branched, so the volume increases, so therefore the density is going to decrease. Okay, because if the volume gets bigger, then the whole fraction gets smaller. Look at the vapor pressure. Do you see the vapor becomes much bigger the more branched it is? The more branched it is, the easier it is to evaporate out, okay? And therefore, the vapor pressure is going to be larger. And then finally, if you look at the flash point, the flash point of pentane is minus 49. Whereas the flash point of your propane is less than minus 7. Okay, so... You can easily see that the vapor pressure increases with increasing branch groups. And if the vapor pressure increases, that means that it's going to be, flash points going to be higher. So now, symmetrical models, this is important, it's just another point that you need to know, tend to have a higher melting point than similar molecules with less symmetry due to the packing in the solid state. In other words, if you've got nice symmetrical models, as molecules, it's very easy to pack them nice and neatly. And if you can pack them nice and neatly, then you can pack them close together. And if you can pack them close together, it means that they're going to have a higher melting point. Okay, now I thought the best thing to do before we carry on with reactions is to go through some nice organic um, chemistry exam paper questions just on the content we've done so far. Okay, which is basically your naming and you're talking about the different functional groups and maybe talking about physical properties. And then after this, we'll go through the reactions and the chemical reactions, your halogenation, hydrohalogenation, your substitution reactions, all the elimination reactions, etc., etc., combustion. And then we will do some more exam paper questions on those type of questions. Okay. So the first question says, name the monoga series to which compound C belongs, compound C. So do you see that C has got a double bonded O? Okay, so we know the double bonded O's are aldehydes, 
or ketones. Okay, but this double bonded O is in the middle. So therefore the monogous series is a ketone. This is a ketone. Okay, moving on. It says write down the IUPAC name of compound A. Okay then, so let's have a look at it. Compound A is this huge thing over here. So the first thing we need to do is we have a look and we see it's all, it's all single bonds. Okay, so that's quite nice. Then we have a look some more. So we're thinking it's a hydrocarbon. But then if we look some more, we see, oh, wait, hang on. Here's a chlorine and here's a chlorine. So that's obviously a halo alkane. It's a halo alkane. It's got a chlorine there and a chlorine there. Now we need to identify the main chain. So it's obviously one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not one, two, three, four, five, and not one, two, three, four, five. So do you agree the main chain, which I'm going to highlight, goes along here, and then it goes along there. Okay, and then it goes along there. So that's my main chain. My next step is to count. I need to count. So I need to count on the side closest to what? I need to count from the side either closest to the branch or the functional group, but in this case we're looking for the functional group. So this is obviously a branch, do you agree? So if we count this way, we get one, two, three, we get our functional group on the third carbon. If we count this way, we get one, two, three, four. So therefore we're going to be counting from right to left. We get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so do you agree that this is a chloro, a chloro alkane octane? Okay, but it has got two chlorine atoms, so it's dichloro, and we need to tell them where we find them, and it's going to be three. 5 dichlorooctane and then finally we need to mention this methyl group because that's one carbon so therefore it's a methyl group the branch is a methyl group so it's methyl and we need to say where it is it's on the fourth carbon so it's 4 methyl 3 5 dichlorooctane okay Let's move on. Now it says, write down the structural formula of a tertiary alcohol that is a structural isomer of compound B. A tertiary alcohol. Whew. Okay, so what is a tertiary alcohol? Let's go through them. The primary alcohol has got an hydroxyl group and it's got one carbon attached to it. So this is a hydrogen, this is a hydrogen. A secondary has got your carbon hydroxyl and then it's got two carbons attached to it, okay? So then obviously a tertiary, a tertiary is going to be a carbon with an hydroxyl group on it and it's going to have a carbon, a carbon, a carbon. There you go. So it's got one, two, three carbons attached to the carbon that's two in the hydroxyl group. But now it says it wants to be a structural isomer of compound B, which means it's got to have the same number of carbons. So it's one, two, three, four. So we need to add a carbon somewhere on here. It really doesn't matter where we add it. So I'm just going to add it here. And then we need to add in our hydrogens. And then we need to check. So let's add in our hydrogens. That's a hydrogen, that's a hydrogen. Hang on a minute, I made one, two, three, four, five. Whoops, I've made a mistake. I have made a mistake, I put an extra carbon. Okay, right, we already had one, two, three, four. We are, one, two, three, four, yes. We already were at our structural formula because they care. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, we were already there. So that is, our isomer. 
Okay, so we've drawn an isomer that happens to be a tertiary alcohol. So let's just count to make sure we've got C4, our H's. Okay, obviously we've got an OH here. So let's count. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's H9. Then you always check by counting again. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's C4. H, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's H9. OH. Okay, so there we go. Okay, let's move on and I just want to erase the stuff. Okay. Right, let's try again. Right, next question. Next question. Now it says an alcohol and a methanoic acid are heated in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid to form an ester. What is the role of the concentrated sulfuric acid in this reaction? Write down, okay, write down the name. In, okay, so first, what is the role of the concentrated sulfuric acid? Okay, <clears throat> if you look at the memo, it gives you two options. It can tell you that either it is a catalyst or it will say it is a dehydrating agent. Now, if you are in the IAB system, you will write down dehydrating agent. Okay, they don't like the answer catalyst. Okay, it is a catalyst, but they really want you to know that concentrated sulfuric acid is taking out water, which is where the next question comes from. It says, write in the name or formula of the inorganic product formed, and that is water, or you could have written H2O. Listen, grade 12, you need to be careful because sometimes they won't be nice like this. Sometimes they'll say, write down the name of the inorganic product formed, and sometimes they'll say, write down the formula of the inorganic product formed. And if you write down water when they wanted the formula, you get no marks, okay? So always read to see what they want. If they want the name or the formula, your life's cool, but otherwise just check, okay? Moving on. Now it says write down the structural formula of methanoic acid. Okay, I can do that. So I'm going to just erase everything. Okay, let's write down the structural formula of methanoic acid. So meth is one, so it's one carbon. Methanoic acid, oic acid, carboxylic acids have a double bonded O, OH, hydrogen, two, three, four. Okay, and that's it. And then, guys, please remember, please remember that you need to draw it out like this. You cannot write C-OH. If you write it like that, it is wrong. I don't care what your textbook says. I don't care what your notes say. That is not considered to be correct. The Western Cape Education, well, the National Government Education wants O-H, and so does the IB system. Okay, so please write it out like that. Now it says, write down the IUPAC name of the ester. Okay, so for the life of me, I can't remember. It says an alcohol and methanoic acid are heated in. So I'm assuming we're looking at B, the alcohol that's B. So we're looking at the B. So they want the IUPAC name of the ester. So we're looking at this. That's our alcohol. And we're adding it to methanoic acid. So obviously you can just write down the answer, but I'm going to show you how we get the answer. So our alcohol in this case is one, two, three, four, is butanol. I could write butan one all, but I don't need to. Butanol. Then the acid is methanoic acid. Okay. Now what happens is, and I'm going to actually, just let me check something, no, they didn't ask us. I'm actually going to show you the structural formula of how this works and how it forms the ester so that you can see where the name comes from. Okay, so watch. You've got C-C-C-C-OH and all these are hydrogens, bear with me, plus methanoic acid is, let's change color, let's make it black for a change, C double bonded O. O dash H, two, three, four, H. I always add them up. Okay, now what happens? The hydroxyl group of the alcohol goes away and it joins up with the hydrogen of the methanoic acid and it forms water. 
and what's left joins. So you end up with C dash C dash C dash. In fact, let me do it in red so you can actually really see what's going on here. So what are you left with? You're left with C dash C dash C dash C and all these little um, so hydrogens and then arm. Um, okay, let me fill them in now. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. <clears throat> Great twelves. I will stress again that if you do not write in all your appropriate hydrogens, you will get zero marks. So please write them in. O dash C double bonded O dash H. Trust your water. Okay. Now you guys know that if you have a branch, like earlier we were talking about this. This was a branch, and we called it a methyl group. The reason it's called a methyl group because it's actually a dash CH3 bond, okay? If I wanted an ethyl group, I'd go C, C, dish, 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 dish. So then that would become an ethyl group. Do you agree? Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Why? Because it's three carbons, I mean two carbons and one arm. So it's an ethyl. So what's happened to the butanol? The butanol has lost its hydroxyl group. So it's lost its functional group, okay? So it becomes butyl. So butanol becomes butyl because it's lost its hydroxyl group. The methanoic acid has lost its hydrogen to become water. So therefore it ends in a double bonded or well, two O's. So it becomes methanoate. Then O8 tells me that it ends in C double bonded O, O, that there is a free arm on that O and that the C double bonded O, O. Okay, so there's how you get the IUPAC name. So you guys, from now on, if you see an alcohol, you know that that's become an, an aisle and the methanoic acid is going to become, or whatever acid is, going to become an O8. And that's exactly how it works. Okay. Let's do another exam paper question. Okay, it says consider the organic compounds represented A through 2G. Okay, they're considered. Let's do the questions. It says define the term hydrocarbon. Now, a hydrocarbon is an organic compound, not just a compound, it's an organic compound made up of carbons and hydrogens only. Okay, please guys, I'm asking you nicely, go and go get the exam guidelines. Exam guidelines. You should all have your CAPS documents anyway, but if you go find the exam guidelines, they are different. They actually list every single definition you guys need to learn. Okay, you can go through it and highlight it if highlighting is the fun thing that you like to do when you're bored. Okay, and learn them because, and learn them word perfectly because about 10% of each of the papers, and trust me, I've counted this, are definitions. So it's crazy not to learn them. It's crazy. Okay, moving on. Now it says, write down the letter that represents a chain isomer of compound A. Okay, chain isomer of compound A. So if we look at this, we need something that has got one, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you see that C4H8. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's a positional isomer, chain isomer, functional isomer, it still needs to have the same number of carbons and hydrogens, okay? So let's have a look at this. Do you see that this is C4H8? This is 1, 2, 3, 4, also C4H8, okay? Butene, but2ene is going to be C4H8 as well, okay? But do you see that... Is anyone else? Okay, one, two, three, four, one. So that's also C4H8. Sure, okay. A chain isomer is what? What is a chain isomer? It is something that has got, it's an isomer. Let's just quickly talk about isomers for a second. Okay, what is an isomer? An isomer is basically an up is a, a basically a molecule that has got the same number of carbons and hydrogens. But now we've spoken about this before, but we haven't actually spoken about the fact that there could be different types of isomers. We haven't spoken about the fact that there's a chain isomer, a positional isomer, and a functional isomer. 
So do you see that this, if I wrote down the name of the A, what would it be? It would just be butene. Butene. But do you agree that it would be exactly the same as writing but one in? But one in. Okay. So whereas do you see that C is but four in and but two in? So what are we saying about that? We are saying that but one in and but two in are chain isomers. Are they necessarily chain isomers? Um, okay, no, actually that's a positional isomer. A chain isomer is one that the chain length has changed. And do you see that here we have got one, two, three is my main chain. Yeah, my main chain is one, two, three, four. Oops, that's C5. So that's not even a contender. So it's not a contender. Let's just get rid of that one. Sorry. Okay, so let's go back to it. So do you agree that this here would be but two in? This is but one in or butene, but this is one, two, three. One, two, three. So do you agree that it actually is a chain isomer because it's got a different length in its main chain? So the correct answer here is B. Now they're asking what is the positional isomer of compound A and that will be C. Okay, positional isomer means all that we've done is we've moved that double bond along to the second bit, so the answer is C. Now they're asking for a functional isomer of compound B. A functional isomer of compound B. So what does a functional isomer mean? Surely a functional isomer would mean something along the lines of that it's got the same the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but it's different. It's got a different function. It's got a different function. So have a look at those and tell me which you think would be a diff have a different as different function. Um, okay. Do you agree that that can't be it because it's got five? One, two, three, four. Hmm, let's have a look at this. Oh no, because that's got a double bonded O, and these are just alkenes, that doesn't work. Okay, so what do we have? It has to obviously be one, either A or C. Now, which do you think it is? Okay, your answer would have to, it can either be, it can either be A or C, because a functional isomer is something that has the same number of carbons, the same number of hydrogens, but it's just arranged differently, so therefore it has got a different function. Okay, do you understand that? Okay, moving on. Oh dear. Okay, now it says, it wants us to write down the IUPAC name of carbon B. I mean, compound B. Okay, so we've already said that the main chain is three. Do you agree that that's the main chain? How do I know that that's the main chain? Because the functional group is in it. Admittedly, this has also got three, one, two, three. Okay, we'd also have a, main, a chain length of three, but then it wouldn't have the functional group in. So I'm saying that definitely, 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 my main chain is the one that goes straight across like this. Okay, and because of that, I also know that my order that I'm going to count in is going to be one, two, and three, because you need to start from the carbon that's closest to the functional group. Okay, so this is going to be what? It's going to definitely be prop in. We don't have to say where the double bond is because it's on the first carbon. And there's a methyl group on carbon two. So it's two methyl propene. Right, grade 12s, I'm afraid I'm going to have to love and leave you for now. Um, please, please make sure that you join us tomorrow if you can. And we will carry on with organic chemistry. And then after these exam paper questions, I'm going to go on to the tricky stuff about reactions of organic compounds. Have a great day.